So the second session, uh, our, our speaker is Jan Guo, and he will talk about uh, building API client SDKs, which our fellow dev developers would be interested in because good SDKs enable developers to adopt API efficiently in their own domains. And so, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, Jenks uh, I, I have, is joining now. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Great, great. So yeah, introduction. Yeah. So I think we are all set now. So I will pass the time to Jenks to talk about it, building API client uh, SDKs. So lovely. After Thanks. Daniel's talk, I think I'll start to look uh, look at Twitter feeds for bird watching right after this talk. Yeah. All right. My name is Jenks. I'm a developer evangelist from Zero. At Zero, we make beautiful ac cloud accounting softwares. Accounting is a boring topic. And when you combine it with IT, let's be honest, it quite frankly gets, gets a bit dry. But Zero had done a good job in making products that are loved by businesses and it's extremely fun to work in it as well. Over the last few years of my career, I have worked for two technology platform companies that interface with hundreds of uh, integration partners. And that means many, many developers. Improving the developer experience is, uh, is at the core of what I do, and it is where my passion is. I love delighting developers. I always use the opportunity to gather feedback from our developer and our app partners on how they can build integration faster and better way, but also in the process with delightful experiences. In the last calendar year, I had 250 of those meetings, more or less. So I have something to say about what developers expect when they're building integrations. I have maintained a successful client SDK project in more than one programming languages. These packages are used by thousands of developers. They're also open source, so they're, they can be contributed to from our de developer community. So I have something to say about why you should build a client SDK to delight your developers and what it takes to build a good client SDK. As I said before, I work for Xero. Uh, Xero makes beautiful accounting software for more than 2 million businesses around the world now. Xero realized early on that just making beautiful software is not good enough. To be innovative and truly solve users' problems fast, you need to transform the software into a platform business where partnership can be formed with financial services providers and other SaaS companies like ours. So building the API platform really is is a is a is an important task because it is a driving force behind building up the business ecosystem. My job as a developer evangelist is to be the human faces of our API platform and evangelize the Zero API to all over the world. The ecosystem is quite busy. We have more than two hundred financial services providers partnering with us, and we have more than eight hundred certified app partners in our app marketplace. We have 11 API sets that translates to about 100 endpoints. The API gateway, as a consequence, gets pretty busy every month. We have 800 million uh, public API calls per month, and we send out two, two and a half million webhooks. We now have more than 50,000 users of our developer tools. Improving the developer experience is something my team really cares about. And a very large part of it is to maintain a set of good SDKs. They're very vital to how developer experience our APIs. This talk is for developers and software platforms who want to build client SDK develop, uh, software, S software development S uh, kits or SDKs, or at least thinking of doing so if you don't already have one. If you're working on technology platforms that offers public API, it is inevitable that you'll get requests from your developers to build API, S API SDKs to help, help them with consuming the API easier. What you, lo you, you will learn here will help you to set up your SDK project for success. I'll cover the value of the SDKs, how to build them, who to build them, what client SDKs are composed of, and the methods, different methods of building them, and how to grow it and scale it after you have built them. Also, a few nice things to have. Has anyone seen a major developer platform and go on the top portal and do not see a SDK or SDKs? 
the chances are slim. Most larger platforms have realized just, use, just having a public API, hopefully RESTful, is not enough. They also need to build client SDKs that nicely wrap around their APIs so developers don't have worked so hard handcrafting each HTTP calls. This way, developers can really focus on the valuable part, which is building the workflows and the solutions for their users or the mutual users of your platform. It used to take uh, at least a dozen lines of computer codes and heaps of testing effort to get one API working. With the help of an SDK, it only takes one line of code, usually. So why is it important? First, because it saves development time. If the developer can save a sprint two weeks, that translates money to your client. That translates the cost to build, cost to serve in your partner's business. And secondly, with SDKs, it makes it easier for them to get a first API, it makes it easier for them to reduce the time to first API call. In programming language, we have time to hello world to measure how quickly developers can pick up the language. In product, there is a concept of turning the user quickly to power users so the, dev so the user feels good about themselves by using the product because they're already power users. They like the tool. They're attached to it. So with the SDK, you can also quickly turn developer into power users. So they're going to say, wow, I'm such a good coder. Are they really a good coder? Maybe not. But secretly, your SDK makes them feel this way. So they're going to love your API because of the experience with the SDK. Thirdly, an SDK is able to avoid bad API calls. One thing that gets developer frustrated and wanting to give up on their project is error messages they keep getting from it when they're developing. They forget small details, like including a header, et cetera, different formats of data. And that gets them want to give up. With the SDK, you can avoid having those happen because it's so abstract out of the SDK methods. With the SDK tools, you can also have the opportunity to embed best practices. So your API server can support more developers and be more scalable in the future. With the help of the SDK, API platforms can delight developers and win the hearts of developers. To many developers, your SDK is your API. Because to most developers, the SDK is the only thing they use to interact with your API. Having an SDK built by you means you have control over developers' experience and is able to improve on it. I've been involved in my company's .NET SDK project for a while. We constantly monitor SDK's feedback from the community. Uh, we get it in, in our support queue as well. We monitor issues on GitHub repo. And what we find is, is quite interesting. There's a few patterns here. The issues raised on GitHub, sometimes they're not about the SDKs themselves. Developer raise issues about APIs in general over there. Why are they getting confused? And that is because to some developers, SDK is the API. The developer judges the maturity of the platform by the quality of SDKs they make. And they might decide whether or not to invest time in this project based on the fact whether you have a good SDK supported by a lot of developers. And developers recommend platforms to their management. For example, their boss told them to build to, uh, say, a CRM platform or zero. But they're going to take a look whether SDK clients are available so they can do, a, do, do the job easily. And they usually come back with the estimate of time. You know, It takes two springs, three springs, whatever. But their boss might make business decisions based on those things. In some cases, I've seen that not having SDK can be a deal breaker in some partnerships. So you can see how important it is to provide a good SDK and do it properly. It is more, it is more clear that there is a real business value behind building the SDK. In finance, it's important to KYC, know your customer before you do business with them. Well, before you build an SDK, before you embark on the journey of improving the developer experience through tooling, you need to, I believe, you need to KYD, which is know your developer. The best sponsor is always coming from your current developers and your partners. There are a few good questions to ask before you build. What programming language should I build for? What, what programming language are your developers using? What frameworks should I build examples for? 
If you don't know, take a look at your recent API logs. You might be able to find some hints from the HTTP header they're sending to you. Some libraries would like to expose it in a user agent. That might give it away. A front-end module is really needed for developers to render UI. It really depends on whether you want to control the experience on the third party's front-end. How efficient do your uh, SDKs need to be? Are they, do they need to be a, a really high production level, or they're OK? If, if there are CRM systems syncing contacts, the data sync is probably not needed to be in real time. Sometimes a daily sync will suffice. But if you're a trading platform, and a lot of people are counting on your SDKs to interact with your APIs to make deals happen, then speed is quite important. Should there be a mobile app? Do you have any developers using mobile apps? Maybe that would delight them a lot. I know plenty of CTOs, good CTOs, who are in the business of building platform businesses. Uh, they always keep a few good external developers they know uh, next to them very closely. And they will actually call them for quick opinion when they're trying to decide on things about API or the future of their APIs. Call or arrange a meeting with six or eight of, you, of them. You'll get a pretty good idea of what kind of SDKs your developers really need. At the start of the SDK project, you don't have the infrastructure for data collection, uh, get those real-time feedback. One-on-one -on -one interviews is a good way to go. A finely crafted HTTP client, let's take a look at what, what's in the uh, anatomy of uh, API SDK. What, what are they composed of? At the center of it, if you look at the red, red part, there is a finely crafted HTTP client, which is, which is in charge of sending the raw HTTP calls. In here, things like base URL, HTTP header, security mechanism are configured globally for the whole SDK. Looking at the example, uh, underneath HTTP client line. In most languages, it looks something like this. So client.postAsync. And then the end, end point, also the JSON body. That's what HTTP client does. The API client wrappers, wraps around the HTTP client. It is loaded with heaps of uh, helper method. That does precisely what uh, the developer needed to do, which is configuring it, setting things like uh, applying filters, uh, making sure the headers are in there, URL parameters are set properly, serialization of API objects uh, when you receive them, deserialization when you're sending them, actually deserialization in the responses and serialization in, in sending them. Uh, it should also be loaded with, uh, with lots of operations that simplifies procedures. For example, for, for a CRM system, it can be as simple as API client dot create contact, and then you shove in a contact object in language. Then it leads to the third part, the data models. Data models defines the, the JSON or XML body of your data. Um, and it helps them a lot of time. Who likes configuring, constructing raw JSON files? If it is as simple as new contact, and I put in my name in there, and there you go, you have a full-fledged a contact object to ready to be sent to the API, that's a, that's a better experience than configuring the JSON files. Authorization module is, is a part that can live inside of your API or outside of it. That's why I put between them. In most API platforms, you probably have some security, uh, security means in, in, in measure. So developers need to interface your authentication authorization framework uh, for example, OWASP 1 or OWASP 2. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They don't have to find a, I know there are a lot of uh, OWASP 2 libraries out there, but they, they also need to configure it. What if you give them a way to easily, easily interact with your authentication framework? So it's as easy as configuring the client ID and secret and do client build login URL, which is often the first step of OWASP 2 authentication for third party software to authorize. Uh, the get authorization from the user to act on behalf of them. So have a think about that. How do we build SDK? How do we approach the projects? Do we hire devs to, to build one by one, or do we, do we, is there a smarter way to do it? So on to the next thing, how do we build it? At Zero, we used to build handcrafted SDKs, like uh, crafting uh, microbrewer, uh, crafting beer. 
And we took a lot of pride in it. Crafted beer tastes good, but they're expensive. They're, they're loved by a lot of people, but they have a price. We took a lot of pride in our handcrafted SDKs before. It is loved by the community, but we can't really keep up with demand in different languages. The good thing about handcrafting is it, it, is, it can be very light. Has low, it can have low dependencies. You might have a better performance and being very lean. And because your developer architected it, uh, you have flexibility on how you want to build and evolve it in the future. The not so good side is it takes a lot of work to maintain it. It's quite resource intensive from a developer side. Changes in the APIs reflects in the SDK depends on whether that developer makes the change. Usually one developer uh, can only develop for one SDK because of specialization in that language. So if you have plenty of dev resources in all different languages, then it is a way to go. You'll kill it on the developer experience. But if you're running a tight shop like, like us, in most cases, API team don't get the, a lot of budget. So, so for that, you will need to be cautious on uh, throwing development resources into it. I've been in IT for a few years. I used to work on the enterprise system with SOAP API and XMLs. In SOAP, not that we we're dealing with any data, dirty data there, hashtag developer dad jokes, we have something called a WSDO, which stands for Web Services Description Language. This is typically a detailed description of what the API models are and the method. So on the client side, they can just take it, spin up all of the methods as they need. It works for .NET, Java, and any language. In this day and age, RESTful API really took over the world. And a convenient feature like WSDO is missing until the birth of open API specification, aka Swagger. Open API specification provides functionalities similar to WSDL, combined with it's a lot more powerful than that. And then it's combined with Open API generator and, and the templates. With, with that, you're able to create SDKs automatically and programmatically in all languages. This provides a scalable way of creating and supporting SDKs instead of handcrafting each, every single one of them. We are at work. One of us can support development work for two or three SDKs in different languages because of the power of open API specification and the code generation we have. To explain the graph on the right a little bit, you can have you can actually bake in Swagger or open API specification right in your API server codes. So it generates automatically the open API specification in YAML or JSON. You can also have a spec maintainer, so someone who's in charge of writing the description of the API. Once it's written, API spec becomes a single source of truth for your API. It is your Bible. And it is then fed into the code generator. You can build CDCI pipelines with this, so it's fully automated. But make sure you have enough unit test cases so you know what the machines are doing and trust the machine. And then you have SDK developers, not just to build, not, not to build the SDKs themselves, but maintain the templates they use to generate those uh, SDKs in different languages. To the far right, you can also have a document generator that has the ability to document your API and also create sample codes automatically for your API sets. So for example, Ruby uh, needs to define variables like this, and the method should be used like this. And, and for the C sharp, it's a different one. That could potentially be your external facing API documentation and um, SDK documentation. So it's it's an odyssey, <laughs> not a drive through. Having SDK is a long project. SDKs cannot can never be perfect. As long as developers start to use them, they will encounter issues in their own implementation. You'll constantly get feature requests, get issues raised by developers, and you need to make constant improvement. So it is important to budget some time and resources to keep, it, keep building it and continuously receive feedback and improve the SDK. Your developers will tell you what to do. If you intend to run your own SDK project as an open source software project and leverage the community support to make it better instead of putting a lot of resources in it, it does take some skills and knowledge 
to make them successful too. I have another talk running on tips on running a successful open source software. Onto the fancy thing. So SDK is a perfect place to build best practices around uh, how, you, how you want developers to use your APIs. You can build in things like a retry, automatic retries into your SDK. So when mistakes happen, that takes that SDK takes care of the, the role of retrying an API call. You can build in a rate limiter, throttle the APIs by the on the SDK level, on the client level, so developers don't have to build their own queue and throttle it. It's a lot of engineering work to do that. We have a we have API limit, and that API limit was 60 calls per 60 rolling second. And it turns out that one of our API had a one second delay between calls. That worked fairly well for a lot of developers. And you can be fancy about it. You can build in automatic retry circuit breaker pattern in the, into it if you want and save heaps of time of developers. You can build batching. Um, so developers know how to use APIs API sufficiently efficiently by creating multiple objects with one single API call. You can also do paging and filtering, et cetera, to build to make the API a little bit smart, smarter. The list goes on. There are all possible things you can build to your SDK. So to summarize, if you're building an ecosystem and a platform business and care about developer experience, you must delight the developer. So build an SDK. Before you build, get to know your developer, find out what they really need. And when you're building it, keep scalability in mind. Consider using open API specification and code generation to automate your pipeline. And remember, it is not a one-time commitment. Be sure to secure enough development resources to support the project in the long term. Thank you very much for having me. I believe uh, I'll need to take some questions now, if there's any. OK. So I have a question for you, Jenks. Um, can we actually charge for SDKs? I've, uh, to be honest, I've actually heard of this before. I think a lot of developers actually expect the SDK to be free. In fact, a lot of APIs are free these days. There's, uh, there's hardly any charging chargeable APIs. Uh, so because of this expectation, it is hard to charge for SDKs. If you do intend to charge SDKs, and I've seen that done before, make sure you really know what your partners want. Typically, it might be a big company asking for that. And uh, you need to justify the value, right? If you can save a lot of development resources uh, of that developer partner, then you justify that cost they're willing to pay. Maybe having a free version and a premium version, uh, that cost a little bit money is a good idea. OK, so um, I think we, we could have uh, several more questions. And sure. do you think, are, are there any drawbacks of uh, auto-generated SDKs? As you have mentioned, it's, it, it, has, it has many benefits, like uh, developers can just uh, use the open API spec and generate the SDKs for their own, like the, the comfortable languages. But are, are there any drawbacks you see in like real real life scenario? Yeah, I probably make it sound too easy. Uh, it's a, it has its drawbacks, and it's easier said than done. There's uh, plenty of quirks uh, in how the API generator and the templates gets uh, between the template and the API generator and the specification. They interpret it slightly differently in different languages. So you get some errors, certain things that you can't do because of how it works. So it's quite difficult to get it right. There's another difficulty, which is unit testing, where um, I'm trying to work on more on that these days. Some generators actually generate the client, uh, the unit testing for the SDK as well, but they're nowhere near uh, what what you what you want, and it doesn't really build up your confidence because it doesn't do the full on testing. So the, these things are probably you need to take a closer look before you embark on the journey. But it is quite scalable. You can propagate any API changes very quickly in all languages, and that's, I think, the benefit is bigger than than its drawbacks at this at this moment. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Great. So, 
thanks James for your uh, yes your session. So really great uh, content about API client SDKs. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for having me.